Between the time when wargamers played with chainmail and the rise of the wizards of the coast, there was an age of gamers. And unto this, Gygax, destined to bear the crown jewel of TSR upon a troubled brow, to show you all how to roll for initiative. Issue number 71 of the Roll for Initiative podcast. This is volume two, the new year 2012. We're back, folks. DM Vince here sitting alongside DM Matt. Hello, everyone. DM Will. Hey there. And the late DM Nick. I'm not late. Just. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I wasn't. I had problems with Skype and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're back to 2012 brand new shows coming to you live. Well, not live, but taped, whatever. So uh, basically, everybody wants to know what this show is going to be about and what who won the contest. Who won? Who won? Me. No. no. <laughs> Anybody know? The, the winner would be DM Kojo. That's right. Ta-da. And as your prize, DM Will will come to your house and DM an adventure for you. <laughs> <laughs> sure that's a prize <laughs> oh, no. no we'll have to get his uh, no, we uh, want to know what that's not what you win <laughs> what happens when you lose <laughs> oh that's messed up nanda don't don't equate me to being a loser now loser no um <laughs> yes you're we'll aware of the from him because uh we need to send him some uh prized uh information he's gonna get himself a coveted Osric Player's Manual, uh, uh, what was it, the uh, Slim Edition. Sweet. And uh, I think, Will, you were going to send something, too. You haven't figured out what it was yet, though. Yeah, I'll find some stuff out. The DM Kojo's been killing me lately because he's making me do all these reviews on all these crazy second edition items and everything. And he just sent me another list, like, of ten more items. And I'm thinking, <laughs> good Lord, that's all I'll be doing here for the next month and a half. Oh, okay. well, you to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's not like you have a job or anything, you retired old Marine. Hey, I love it, though. But you know what, though? I'll find something, and I'll send him something special. I know. I'm just jealous. <laughs> okay. So, um, what have we been up to since we last talked? Uh, let's start with uh, Will. What have you been up to? Well, basically, you know, everyone knew that I moved into this house um, and uh, just basically got everything unpacked. And now I'm just ge- I'm gearing up now for the uh, convention year. A lot of great gaming you know, opportunities have come up. There's some new gaming conventions. So I'm looking forward to doing some uh, serious board gaming. I already have my uh, D&D. Actually, I'm doing first edition D&D module adventures ready for those conventions too as well. So I'm looking forward to this year as far as gaming and convention going. Cool. Uh, Nick? Yes. <laughs> Jeez, what have you been up to, Nick? <laughs> what have I been up to? I'm sorry, I'm just um you know, uh the holiday season was good. Um as usual, we took our little hiatus during around Christmas and New Year's, but we'll be starting up on our campaign again um this coming weekend. I gotta remember where we left off. So uh you know, we're doing, you know, that uh kind of like the Castle Greyhawk kind of thing that we're doing. And um, other than that, just uh, I don't think I'm going to be doing any conventions this year. Uh-huh. Um, I was hoping to do Origins, but unfortunately, uh, I, I just don't see that happening. I already got something else going on this summer. I got a, I got a family reunion going on. I'm, I might try to get over to – I would like to go to – what is it? Um, Gen Con. No, well, maybe Gen Con. Uh, we'll see. I mean, you oh, know, you promised I, ends in 2011. You'd I be- know, I know, but you know, the family and everything. <laughs> Bring them. It's Gen Con's good family fun. Yeah. Yeah. Take the whole family reunion there. Yeah. No. Oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Now my own family, sure, I can handle that. The wife and kids would be okay because they would like do something else in Indy. Yeah. But. Like the other rest of the clan, no, no. All right. So Nick will not be going to any convention except for North Texas RPG Con, right? 
Uh, no, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so where you, where are you going? Spill the beans. Well, I I might try to go to Gary Con. Uh, oh, so up there, and it's in a couple of months. I hope to go to that. There's also a smaller local convention here in February called BashCon. It's up at the University of Toledo. I haven't been to that for a number of years, so I might do that one too. Just you know, just to go up for a day and hang out. Don't you have corn on the cob too, or something like that? Yeah, con on the cobs in October. Yeah, corn on the cob, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, we have corn on the cob. I would have corn on the cob. It's con on the cob. <laughs> yeah, we have corn on the cob. It's delicious. But con on the cob, on the other hand, yeah, that's mid October, and I might go to that one too. That's a more local one too. But that's I don't know. We'll we'll see. I mean, I might just who who knows? I might just pop down to Origins like just over the you know Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Who knows? We'll see what happens. That's a better name. Con on the cob than like most of them I've heard. Like they have one here, Texacon. That was real original. That name. Yeah, I mean you're just one short of Texaco. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds like a gas station. Let's go to Texacon to get some gas. <laughs> yeah. Okay, play some and words. Yes, <laughs> gas and D twenties. Woo! So uh, Matt, what have you been up to? Oh, been very busy. Just I do way too much when it comes to side projects because okay, I have a I work my regular job and then I also. Every Saturday night, I do video production for professional wrestling. Yep. And then I got roped into doing some acting as well in a local independent film. And I also write game reviews, and I do the podcast. So actually, the few weeks off over the holidays was actually a nice little break for me to just uh, recover from everything. Because I was just You're running a... myself ragged there for a while. Wow. Man of many uh, different uh, interests there. Yeah, cool. I'm... I just have a short attention span, so I have lots of different hobbies I dabble in. Oh, and okay. Look, something shiny. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. And it's like after we finish this podcast, I'll be leaving straight to go to my weekly gaming session that's starting back up, too. So Yay. start playing some Deadlands again. Yay. Yep. So, yeah. So no. quick prediction, uh, Matt. Royal Rumble 2012. Who's going to be the winner of the Royal Rumble? Uh, provided his back's okay, Randy Orton. Man, then he bring back King Kong Bundy. He'll whoop his butt. Oh, he has. King Kong Bundy. Now you're talking old. And school. he's <laughs> gorilla yes, monsoon. monsoon. Yep. And the <laughs> thing is, King Kong Bundy still looks the same tw- thirty years later. I know it's just amazing, ain't it? The guy's great. Oh yeah, he's awesome. I'm gonna call an odd prediction here, but I think it's gonna be Cody Reynolds. Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes. I'm thinking it'll be Cody and uh, Gold Dust at Mania. Yeah. <laughs> I think Hacksaw Jim will take it. Oh, jeez. Yeah. God, he's still wrestling? That guy is old. He still pops up on, he still just... pops up on indie shows, and yeah. he actually did win a Royal Rumble, 1989. Hacksaw Jim. I just 19 win? No, 1988. He won the very first. Rumble. Well, he was young back then. We're talking about 2012 now. I mean, that's Jarrett all time. Yeah, but, I, but I know who would beat them all. It's obvious. Hulk Hogan. Chuck, Chuck, Chuck Dark. Dark. Yeah. Who? Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris? Who is that? Anyway. <laughs> Me, what about you, Vince? I've been up to a big move moving from Pennsylvania to Texas. I am officially in Texas. This is the first RFI from Texas. So. All right. And I'm getting my awesome. gaming group together, hopefully. An actual live in-person gaming group. Yay. Yay. Awesome. I'm setting up my 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 man cave. Like Will has his man cave. I have mine too. <laughs> Sweet. I got in my apartment. We have this big loft, and up there where I my my studio equipment, and I have enough room to actually have a gaming room in here. It's so big. Wow, that's impressive. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't have as many books as you do, Will, as to like cover like three decades worth of room. Oh. <laughs> Some of the pictures you showed me of your room, I was like, geez, is he living with books surrounding him? One. <laughs> I thought maybe well, you pillows his books at one point. Well, I'm waiting for it, you know, someone to come to my house and say, hey, you're on the next Hoarders show, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's a good Hoarders, though. <laughs> you have treasures in those. You're, like, taking food and shoving it in the corner going, I can eat this later. It's oh, not green. No. You know, I'm just waiting one day I get, I get killed by a ton of dice that falls on me <laughs> yes. and I suffocate. Hey, that's what a way to go. <laughs> Splatted by a splat book. <laughs> uh, 
Ian Will, oh, man. Ian Will passes away today. D20 dice hits him right in the head. <laughs> and we buried him inside his dice bag. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh, boy. And if you go to the site, there is some new T-shirts up. So if you want to take a look at those or the Simple Design RFI podcast, people were asking about shirts. There is a shirt there for you to look at, rfipodcast.com. Some people were asking about the app. Matt and I were talking about that today in email. Uh, some people were having problems finding the Droid version of the app. I don't know what's going on. That we're going to look into that, but it is on the Amazon Marketplace if you need to find it. Correct, Matt? Yes, it is, and I'll put a link uh, to it on the Amazon Market in the show notes so everyone can easily find it. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Anybody have anything else to say? Uh, pie. Pie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> pie is good. Yummy. There you go. There. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's head over to Save Your Vice. Master. Master. They're at the gates again. Master. It looks like another band of adventurers. Adventurers. Again? Always the same. Coming to me for sage advice. Sage advice. Sage advice, hey. Oh, now he sings. <laughs> now he sings. <sighs> i got a couple emails here. Uh, one comes from Trey Manor. Actually, he's calling in to throw his hat in the ring because he owns uh, Red, Box Game- Red Box Games in, I believe it's Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He wants to tell us that he sell he sells miniatures like uh, dwarves, elves, humans, half orcs, and everything for people to buy for first edition or earlier game, old school, you know, role playing. You can go to red hyphen box hyphen games dot com slash shop, and you can take a look at what he has there. He has some pretty good old school miniatures and stuff there, mostly twenty eight millimeter. I think that's I believe that's what it is. Cool, yeah. sounds nice. Yeah, but he said he's a long-time listener and just wanted to throw his hat in there and let everybody know there's another another place you guys can go to find some of the stuff you miss. And he promises to give us good prices. <laughs> Sweet. Well, what then kind? we're going to hold you to your word. <laughs> yes. Are these uh, plastic miniatures? Or are these the old lead or pewter? Or what are they? He doesn't actually say. I'm pulling up right now to look at it. They're made of galilinium. <laughs> what? Electrum. Oh. <laughs> They're made of electric pieces. Ta-da! See, a use for electric pieces. I don't know. They look pretty cool, though. Uh, white. Let's see. The one I'm one I'm looking at is uh, white metal. Yeah, they uh, might be pure. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he might be doing like uh, I think it's called P65, whereas Reaper sells their miniatures and they're like ten dollars or whatever. Yeah. But P65 uses the 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 more whitish, yeah, pewter like, and yeah. it's like you know half the price. Uh, That's not bad. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. These free it says on it, lead free. Yeah. The, yeah. These figures they're in like eight ninety nine. Yeah, but look at them. They're beautiful. I know. They're they're awesome. He must got some nice molds and everything. Yeah. Look at some of the goblins and yeah, yeah they look pretty good. You yeah. can goblin horde here. Yeah. Nice. I, I would three ninety nine for a goblin archer. Oh. Oh, that's three singles. Wow. 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 Yeah, okay. that's not bad. Yeah, definitely worth checking out. There's some really nice stuff here. <laughs> oh, and they give he gives you the round bases too with it. Hey. Oh, I might actually look into this then. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it was that cheap. Oh, I bet I say that over the air. Everyone's going to go <laughs> on me. Yeah. Okay, and the next email, let's see what we got. Here another email comes from Ken Kakoza. And he says that he is a dedicated fan and DM of the dreaded fourth edition Q ominous music. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. But he feels that our show still offers a lot of valuable insight and information to his game. He looks forward to every episode. In the future, he'd love to play a 1E game and see what the experience is like. He says that in the future, he might send some mail discussing how your discussion of 1E has helped my 4E game, but for now, just keep rolling those 20s. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And see, because it has to rely on a previous edition to be better. Yeah. And well, actually, de- <laughs> <laughs> de- depending on what uh, Wizards of the Coast does with the uh, whatever 
they call it Dungeons and Dragons the, coming up. He may be playing a first edition yes. soon. I didn't know where we were going to talk about that. Well, it is the 800 pound, uh, you know, uh, ogre in the room right now. Yeah. Well, we we, we we did a special Save or Die podcast about the elephant in the room fifth edition. Go check that out. Uh, Save or Die podcast info. You can take discuss about all the fifth edition, what we thought about it. Enjoy it there. There's that. And if you want to write in RFI staff at gmail.com, or you can call the following number, 570-825-4210, the hotline. Hotline. <laughs> Where Nick is standing by now. No, he's not. <laughs> I'm sitting down. Oh. <laughs> Nick and a bunch of kobolds are standing by. No, I kicked the kobolds out. We're moving up in the world. We've gone to goblins. Are you sure we have the budget for that? Yeah, we're paying them electrum pieces. We're good. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we, let's see. We have one more email. DM Brian called in and told us, he's like, have you guys ever heard of Addict? A-D-D-I-C-T. Yes. Yes, yes uh, I have. Yeah, have. I don't really use that system. I know it was made up by somebody in Dragon's Foot. Yeah, it was. It, it's a um, basically... From what I remember, it's a several-page compilation of how the combat rules work in first edition. Yeah. Uh, so tweaks to it here and there. Yeah, I haven't used it. I might look into it though. I know it's right there on Dragon's Foot. Cool. And that's about it. And let's head, head right over into table matters. Yeah, I remember back in the day. A fella knew how to judge a fireball on the fly and how far the cleric could push the undead he turned. I tell you, with all these min-maxers and munchkins, metagame and power game, there's something missing that I'm here to learn you. Now sit down and crack your book while I commence to teach you some. Table manners. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a character race that, you know, in over 30 years of, of game and everything, I rarely see being played these days, and that is the gnome. Gnome. The gnome, yes. When I think of gnomes, I think of those garden gnomes that people stick out in their gardens outside mm-hmm. in the backyard and their vegetable gardens yeah. or what have you. Uh-huh. They're always sitting on mushrooms or they got this silly grin on their face. Kind of scary sometimes. Yeah. I've always imagined just pouring some water on them and they come to life. <laughs> Well, there's something weird about those things. It just reminds me of the clown on it. <laughs> but for what it's worth and everything, I mean, mm. that, I mean, a gnome is what it is. Uh, I really do not know why people do not like to play gnomes, probably because there's better races to play. I mean, a gnome is a half-pint-sized dwarf. That's what I look at it as anyway. But uh, they're very limited in, you know, what uh, class they can play. You know, they can go up to fighter to a maximum of six level. Now, I'm going by the first edition PHB right now. Of course, we know that the Unearthed Arcana that allows them to uh, gain uh, greater levels. That is, if you stick by the level uh, limitations, uh, they can go up to an illusionist to a maximum of seventh level. And a thief or an assassin, a maximum of eighth level. Now, per the Unearthed Arcana, however, uh, depending on their prime prerequisite for their class... Uh, they can go up to cleric. Um, they, they can go up to 10th level. I'm, I'm just assuming they have an 18 in their ability score. They can go up to 10th level. Uh, the fighter, well, they're still at 5th level. And uh, they, can go, they can go as unlimited as thief. Which one, the fighter? The gnome can go unlimited as thief. Oh, yeah, unlimited as thief, yeah. But the fighter... Uh, Provided they have an ability score of 18, they can be 7th level as an illusionist, unlimited as a thief, and they can go to 8th level as an assassin. And then, of course, later on as they continue to adventure, and let's say they get the prereqs to a 19 or a 20 or a 21, they can go up a couple more levels. The maximum level, of course, for a thief, it's, it's unlimited. They can go to 30th level thief. But for Assassin, it's 10th level. For Illusionist, it's 13th. Fighter, it's 9th level. And Cleric is 14th level. So why would you play a gnome? Well, like I said, a gnome is, is, is almost like a dwarf. They do have some special abilities. Uh, one of them being that they're highly magical resistant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the spells, 
uh, rods, staffs, and wands, and so on. Uh, besides that, they do have infravision, which goes up to 60 feet in darkness, if I'm correct. Yeah. And then they have all those other little abilities when they're underground, like det- detect grade or slope and passage, upwards or downwards, detect unsafe walls, ceilings, or floors, determine approximate depth underground, determine direction of travel underground. When any time that you're traveling underground, these abilities are extremely important. But besides that, that's how much I can tell you about the gnome. I don't know too many people playing a gnome. Uh, the first time I ever played a gnome character was at a tournament module when I was in Fort Rucker, Alabama. Uh, the character sheets were upside down. We all sat down. We lift the sheet up, and I get this gnome illusions. I said, oh, no, I'm going to die first. Because I, I just don't know too much about gnomes back in that time period. And you mm-hmm. know what? I forgot something else about gnomes. You know, when it comes to when they attack... Uh, uh, kobolds or goblins, they add one to their dice rolls to hit them. Right. And when they're being attacked by gnolls, bugbears, ogres, trolls, ogre, magi, giants, and or titans, gnome characters subtract four from their opponents to hit die rolls because of their small size and their yep. combat skill. I mean, like, duh, if you're 20 feet tall and you're trying to hit something that's two foot nine, I would suspect it'd be a lot more hard to hit them. Probably. <laughs> But then again, you know, I mean, like I said, that's what I do know about gnomes. I haven't seen them being played much. That, that's, that's, that's the limit of my, my knowledge on them, to be honest with you. So what is y'all's take on gnomes? Well, um, there is one article I do recall that was written in Dragon Magazine. And you can find it in two areas. It was originally published... Uh, issue number 61 in May 1982, and also it's in the Best of Dragon Volume 3, which I got here, and it's called The Gnomish Point of View. And uh, it was one of the articles written by uh, uh, Roger Moore uh, back in the day. He did a whole bunch of articles, the Elvish Point of View, the Dwarf Point of View, and so on. And he did one, The Gnomish Point of View. And it's a really, I think it's a really good two-page little article on unknowns, their society, and give a little bit of ideas on how to play them. They ha- there's some really cool ideas how basically how you, and this is just one person's take on it, obviously. So, you know, take it for for what it's worth. But um how Moore puts it in his article is gnomes are they're kind of a in between race, as far as where they their environment is, they're not exactly living in the forests and the woodlands like the elves, but they're they don't delve too deep into earth like dwarves. They're 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 kind of in the middle. You usually find dwarf, uh, you know, gnomes in uh, they have complex, elaborate underground tunnels. Their communities generally don't go as deep, but they're very far and widespread compared to the uh, dwarves. And yet um, they still have an affinity for, you know, woodland creatures, hence the whole thing that they could talk to, you know, small woodland animals like badgers and moles and woodchucks and whatnot. (laughs) So that's why, and, and they generally view these creatures not as like, as pets, but more as equals, as companions, as friends. So, um, and also commu- the communities are rel- are pretty closely knit and uh, they trade generally in jewel craft, mining, metalworking, uh, minor amount of farming, hunting, and they usually help with the local militias uh, in military matters. So, but and, and it goes on on. It's a very good article. I highly recommend. One of the things out of this article, I think that kind of became part of the gnomish part of the gnomish way. The the way to play a gnome was they are they're tricksters, they're pranksters, you know. <laughs> and I think that was kind of taken up in maybe later editions, but I think you see the uh, beginnings of that. That the gnomes gnomes uh, have a interesting. Uh, sense of humor is like they they like to play practical jokes huh. on on people. Um, they yeah, that's you know that's very true because I know that their one deity, uh, I can't remember his name for the life of me right now, 
plays tricks on the uh, the the kobold god a lot. Yes, uh, Garl yeah. uh, Garl Glittergold, and That's they talk it. about that. In fact, it was <laughs> uh, it's the, right in here. The that... ne- next article, Gods of the Gnomes, is on page thirty one. That's yep. right. Yeah, this is Garl <laughs> uh, Garl Glittergold once caused Curdle Mac's most elaborate and richly decorated throne room to develop a structural def- defect in the ceiling, making it collapse. At an untimely moment when the Cobalt God was entertaining one of the major arch devils. <laughs> the awful. latter believed the ceiling collapse was an assassination attempt. And in, Venge- <laughs> and in Vengeance hung Curdle Mac by the tail over an active volcano for six weeks. <laughs> the Cobalt God has since devoted all his energies to the destruction of all gnomes, but his efforts seem to have only made the gnomes tougher on the whole. All in all, it was a grand joke indeed. <laughs> so that's awesome. So yeah, the 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 gnome, gnomes not only they they play little practical jokes and pranks, and they're more about like it's not like you know um, like telling jokes. They're more about like slapstick humor, I guess, if you will. And sometimes that bleeds over into how. They are as thieves and illusionists. Sometimes if they're going to cast a spell or set a trap or something like that, it's going to be humorous. Right. It's going to hurt the bad guy, but it's going to be darn right. funny. Yeah, they're the, so it's kind of dark humor there. A yeah, bit, they're the probably. comic relief of any adventuring party. Oh, yeah. You know, they always do it with a smile. Right. <laughs> so well, As long as I don't have a, a three players playing gnome characters and their name is Mo, Larry, and Curly. I th- I, there would be a total there would be a total party kill within twenty minutes. Yeah. It's it's a really good article if you want to get an idea how to play a gnome. And I read through it before. I'm like, you know, gnomes. When you read through this, you can really, as a role in a role playing aspect, make gnomes uh, stand out as an individual, as a more uh, interesting race. Right. Yeah. The, with gnomes. They're a role player's race, not a min maxer's yeah. race, because no. anything they can do, another race does better. They're like the sec yeah, the poor man's dwarf. But right. from a role playing perspective, they're completely different. I it, would like to see a poor man's dwarf. What would that look like? Yes. <laughs> well a gnome. That's a gnome. That's a yeah. gnome. <laughs> That's a gnome. It's a gnome. But a gnome. Yeah. See, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that because I think gnomes are cool in the aspect because if you look at the the, the strengths that they have, the the trickster, the prankster sort of thing, the practical joke sort of thing, it's that's role playing gold right there. Oh, absolutely. When you are playing if you're playing up the two classes that they that they are very good at being a thief mm-hmm. or being illusionists, and if you're I. I have done this. I'm pl- I'm gonna plan on doing it again. Playing a gnome illusionist thief have so much fun. When you combine those two classes oh. with the gnome, it's like the trifecta of fun. Oh, yeah. It's it's so much fun you can have with that. Yeah, it was in uh, Grimm's Two Traps. There's one trap in particular. I could just see a gnome casting it. There's a pit trap where you cast an illusion spell over the pit. So the pit itself looks like it's a floor and the floor on the side of the pit looks like a pit yeah that yep. would be a very gnomish type trap yeah <laughs> and i've used that yeah. so <laughs> yeah i think uh there's a uh, another module where there was a gnome mentioned in there his name was prit and he was tunneling through uh i3 which i believe is pharaoh mm-hmm. and uh i know that the party run into him as, a, as an npc kind of character he's, he's tunneling around with a spoon so that's that's how i remember gnomes they just do the, they're in the weirdest places I, i'm they're, they're more akin to leprechauns and and gremlins as far as i'm concerned i was i'm sorry again nick i i don't know i i guess they could be akin to like leprechauns and stuff like that but um i think as a standard player race i i think it like with with Matt was saying, I think they're just they're it's a real fun role playing opportunity. You just can't look at him as just uh, like you know min maxing the 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 stats and everything. Um, but 
that you can almost say that for almost any race that you play. But um, I like uh, also they talk briefly about the uh, the deep gnomes, the Nerf Neblin. Yes, I actually pronounced that right, Nerf Neblin. <laughs> the deep gnomes. And uh, but, but yeah, if you can find the the article and also about the gods of the gnomes, yeah, issue sixty one, May nineteen eighty two, or if you have Best of Dragon Volume three, it's in there, and I highly highly recommend it. So, yeah, and see, that was a good thing you brought that up because using the unearthed arcana rules, you can play both the regular gnomes out of uh, the player's handbook, or you can play the deep gnomes, which you just however you pronounced. Yeah, Nerf Neblin. Yeah, you can say that. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> I think I, way, they, they had a pronunciation guide in Dragon, and it was in there. I'm like, oh, that's how you say it. <laughs> <laughs> the and, only thing about the Deep Gnomes is, if you look at the Unearthed Arcana, is that one ability is summoning Earth Elementals. <laughs> I think that's a little too powerful. Yeah. <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> I know whenever I think of Gnome NPCs, I always think of researchers or scientists things right. someone that's doing things for the future and oh, like tinker gnomes not not re, not the tinker gnomes that mess everything up but every time when i play a game people are like oh i want to find a gadget or an item that does this or that so it's like let's go find the gnomes you know we still like oh, that. Okay. yeah i think they're what somewhat mechanical in nature or uh they they had this funny idea how to do stonework and mechanical things and gears and whatever you call all that stuff. I see them the opposite. I see them more in tune with nature because just how they are according to the article, I just see, I don't see them so much like working with mechanical things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I just see them as being a race that will take the longest path to actually accomplish something but as long as they're having fun along the way. They, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I could finish this task in a day or I could do this elaborate contraption or take this extra long path. But it'll be a lot of fun. So and yeah. it'll take twice as long, but that's OK. Right. <laughs> the, the, those, yeah, well, they are very long lived. They can live up to 600 years old. Well, right. So time doesn't matter. It's all about the experiences along the way. So they're not going to necessarily rush to get anything done. I like that thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the it's not the end, it's the journey. Exactly. <laughs> and when and, and when you're one of the longest lived races, you have lots of time for the journey. You betcha. Poor gnomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess if, if anybody has any comments out about the gnomes, email us or write us. Well, we don't have physical address anymore, so you can't write us. So, well, yeah. well, you could always write us and scan it. Yeah, yeah, yes, write. Just email us. <laughs> <laughs> or call. You, you know what is so funny? RFI staff I... at gmail dot com. Correct. Yes, it is. Oh, Nick got it right. You got it yeah. right. But right. I will hook you all up. There's a guy down the street here. He's really weird. Mm -hmm. Never seen him before in my life, but I'm going to take a picture of his yard because he's got gnomes everywhere. And, and stone frogs, stone owls, stone everything, spiders, hands. I'm going to take a picture of that later on. I'm going to show you what he's it is. Medusa. Uh, or is, I'm, I'm or is he a Medusa? No, I'm scared of gnomes. I'm scared of gnomes. Mm. All right, cool. Send us those pictures. We'll put it on the website. Oh, I will. Head over to Game Mechanics. Oh man, what the heck is that? Let us hide, you fool. I have a spell that will work here. What do you mean I can't hit with that? All oh, right, fine. Show it to me in the book. Welcome to Game Mechanics. And now we are in Game Mechanics. And we're going to discuss something that I think we can safely say all DMs love. Cursed weapons and cursed items. But <laughs> Yes. Oh. But there's always that problem of event. Sometimes it can be 
kind of easy for the players to figure out this item is cursed upon just picking it up. So we're really going to focus on how to prevent that. How do you use cursed weapons or items and get a little more life out of it as opposed to, oh, no, all my fellow uh, companions are hitting on a 15, but I can only hit on a 17. That obviously means this weapon is minus two. How do we stop Mm. that from happening? Well, that's easy. Yeah. Don't let the players roll. (laughs) Well, no, I mean, no. They can no, roll. It, just, just tell they, they, what they're going to do is they're going to roll, add all their bonuses and everything. They're going to tell the DM, "This is what I rolled," mm-hmm. and, or what give them the total. The DM is going to subtract and and tell them you missed. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I know what Matt's saying. The player's going to say, "Well, I hit on a fifteen normally, so what's going on?" Right. Here? Or or the fighter next to me, hit, same level, hit on a fifteen, but I'm hitting yeah. on a seventeen. We have the same bonus. We have the same bonuses we see. Why am I different? Well, in that case, then, that's where a DM will have to adjudicate some way of letting that character know that he's doing something way different. It's, it's a subtle difference right. in the fighting ability. Like, for example, as you are hitting the creature, you notice that the sword kind of like bends a little bit to yeah. actually avoid the creature you're hitting, or it phases through the monster right. you're hitting, uh, or, you know, whatever. The sword or, said, well, maybe, you know, why did Bob the fighter hit? Right. And when I used this new sword, I killed everybody in the party. I don't remember doing it. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, my <laughs> words nerf on the oh, I wonder why. Oh, hmm. oh. oh yeah. Sword curse berserking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how do you prevent that? Well, that, I think, kind of goes into the whole metagaming concept right. where you got to separate player knowledge from character right. knowledge. I mean... And yeah, I mean, you have to have some good players to know that you know what you found a cursed sword, but your your character doesn't know it's cursed yet. Right. It like with I know with my home group, we actually enjoy playing situations like that. If we have like some sort of disadvantage, we will play it up, and we think this is like this is the greatest sword ever, and I must mm-hmm. use it more because we just have fun doing that. But that's some. But if you have a more min max power gamer, they're going to hate that. All right. So, but I mean, something else you could even do is maybe it's cursed, but it does some. But it doesn't necessarily affect. If say if it's a cursed weapon, it doesn't affect their combat. It affects something else totally unrelated. Right. So it would take a while to actually put two and two together. This sword is causing all the dogs in the community to like want to pee on me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of weird, but it yeah. sounds like something a gnome would create. Exactly. Yeah. Even better, yeah, it's a sword negative two, but maybe it's negative two to your hit points. Right. Negative well, something- two to your charisma. Yeah. Well, there's also not just that, but you know the you know what we always think of cursed magical items. The the magic the cursed magic sword always kind of leads to mind, but there's like right. there's a couple other like cursed magical items that are not like they are not weapons like. Uh, what's one? A necklace of strangulation? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. The, uh, yeah, the lodestone is one of my favorite. I love the, the lodestone. Yes, there lodestone. you go. That the thing lodestone. is That's... awesome. I can't get off the ground. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's another one? Uh, some oh. of the magic tomes that if the you're not the cr- yeah, there's rug the of rug smothering. Is smothering. Yeah. Yep. Yes. There's I'm also. Doing- there's also certain magical tomes that if you're not the right alignment, if you read them, you get hurt. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm oh, yeah, trying those, to. Those I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it's like. Well, I know the book of uh, ineffable damnation. If a good character even touches you, take damage, <laughs> and even reading it, you lose a level or something. The book right. of vile uh, darkness. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's some nastiness yeah. out there. There's some nastiness out there. But you know, I like weapons like the spear. I believe the spear minus two backbiter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you actually use the spear, it bends right back around and strikes you instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. I mean, you can't get rid of these weapons. You know, you can throw it on the ground, but it magically reappears back in your hand. Right. Curse weapons are nasty. I, I, I picture, you know, using that spear and smacks you in the face, just like that Donald Duck <laughs> one where he yeah. has the quarter staff. <laughs> Thwack. <laughs> yeah, turn, but you know, it's been turn. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, but cursed weapons, you know, that DM has to adjudicate that properly. And, and, and you know, as I despise metagaming, I would never let anyone know what's cursed unless they eventually try and get it identified or if they do some type of divination on it, determine what, what is going on. There is something wrong here. The moment they try to use a different weapon, then they will know something's wrong when, when they can't. That weapon will drop to the ground and the magical weapon or the cursed weapon comes back into their hands again. Yeah, a lot of them are like that. Yes. And they're, they're the cursed magic items... You know, like we're talking about the cursed weapons here. Uh, you could usually get away with at lower levels. Once the characters get a higher levels, they they generally, you know, they get smart and they're like, well, we better carry a few identify spells on some scrolls. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, and then uh, before we touch anything in the horde, we'll identify it. So sometimes they're like that, but there's... I mean, if we kind of broaden this, if we get beyond the the, the cursed weapons, there, you know, there's also one other magic item that they're they're not exactly cursed, but they have bad side effects are the artifacts and relics. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you get the ones where, you know, oh great, it raises my level, but I lose all my body hair. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or something like that. Right. It's like well, it, the yeah, one sword that. Uh, if you roll a natural 20, it also does a uh, level drain on the target you hit. What if we spun that? It's a magical, like, plus two sword. But if you roll a natural 20, it drains a level from you. Ooh. Yeah, that's not cool. That's not cool at all. Right. <laughs> but th- that way, the players would think, oh, I got this great weapon, because most of the time, they're going to be rolling, and they're going to see, oh, I get plus two to hit. This is great. Until they roll yeah. that 20. Yeah, and then yep. <laughs> right that some just little spins like that where most of the time it works to their benefit, except when this somewhat rare occurrence happens, and then yeah. all of a sudden, oh wait a minute. <laughs> Well, that, that was just like you were saying. That was what just you were saying about the uh, magical items, the cursed items, and identify spell. You also find out with some cursed items, they will still identify and detect as a plus two or a plus one or right. whatever. Right. So it isn't until they actually pick it up and says, I think I'm going to use that. The moment that the player character makes that comment that this is going to be my weapon, that's when the curse goes into effect. Right. right. Exactly. And then you get this into some interesting role-playing opportunities. Now they have that <laughs> cursed weapon. How are they going to get rid of it? Yeah. That, that's when you start seeking, okay, we need, they start seeking out the clerics for the remove curse, or they're like, yeah. okay, where are we going to get some wish spells? Wish spells, limited yeah. wish. Or uh, they have to go on a, a quest of some type I, that will actually there you go. get right. rid of the curse itself. And, mm-hmm. and that is one, one of the better ways of getting people into an adventure that they never thought about going to. But we don't want to do that because that's too scary. We want to use curse, and the only way you can do it is by dispelling the evil creature there. Or, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, mm-hmm. that Good possibilities with good DMs. Right. Yep. Or you just go find a gnome to help you out. Yeah. I'm. T- well, I just you, thought of you, uh, you consult the gnomes that make them. <laughs> I just, I just thought of a really good example of how you can role play a cursed magic item, particularly a cursed sword. I don't know how many of you remember uh, reading Knights at the Dinner Table, or uh, and oh, yeah. there was a. The Carvin Marvin one, hmm. the Carvin the the Carvin Marvin uh, 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 one is fantastic because they they got a new player in the group of the knights, and this he wants he wants a big sword for his character, and um, they're like, well, we could go get Carvin Marvin. And they're like, oh, I don't know, if that's a very good idea. He's kind of got an attitude. <laughs> Who's Marvin? So they're like, oh. so we go. They go get. Carvin Marvin and um, Carvin Marvin, they like because it's an intelligent weapon. And um, what happens is Carvin Marvin takes over the body of the person. And uh, yeah, it becomes a very interesting situation where like it takes over him. And he's like, you know, hacking off uh, body parts and uh, hurting the rest of the players in the party. So it's a good uh good role playing opportunity there. 
So uh, what about those weapons that are not really cursed, but using them a curse like uh, perhaps Black Razor from White Plume Mountain? Oh, Black Razor is just uh, it's Stormbringer's lesser known cousin. (laughs) (laughs) It it really is. It's Stormbringer translated over into the game. Yeah, but still a nasty sword. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of those swords that could take you over because, you know, the ego of it is greater than what you have. And, wow, now he's running you around. Oh, well. (laughs) That's how I look at him. Like, oh, well, you picked him up. You're using him. Guess what? (laughs) I think it it would almost be interesting to, before they pick it up, the sword starts communicating with them. Like, leave me alone. (laughs) In fact, in the, in fact, in the, uh, in the, 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 uh, the strip, uh, Carvin Marvin was de- uh, was described as like Don Rickles with a migraine. Oh, so oh, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking more of uh, Marvin from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, uh, that, no, this Carvin Marvin was nasty. Yeah, I, I'm I'm just imagining if you had one that was just depressed. Not another uh, orc. <laughs> really? Must we go on another adventure? Killing and killing, that's all I ever see. I played it. I was, me and my friend, we played a dep- depressed emo cleric before. Why should I bother healing? You're just going to get hurt again anyway. <laughs> I would, I would dead? Oh, you're going to die yet again. Anyway. I think that's going to wrap that up. What do you think? Yeah. Did we beat that one down? <laughs> yeah. All right, Creature Featured coming up next. That is not dead. Not dead. Not dead. Not dead. Not dead. Not dead. And with strange ears, even death may die. I welcome the unwary to the Creature Feature Theater. Okay, folks. Uh, creature feature this week. We have. I like. I like this creature. You don't see it a whole lot, but it's it's really nasty. And that's the Roper. And you I'm mean, not talking about the Ropers on Three Company either. Oh, you were my. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. Tell me not. No, coming? they don't like. They're not cranky uh, landlords in apartment complexes. Oh, Stanley. <laughs> go ahead. But the Roper it. In Monster Manual on page 83, I, I love this creature. I think it's one of the quintessential D&D monsters, the Roper. And it's pretty nasty. Just looking at its stats uh, on, on its own, I mean, you could have one to three of them appearing. Armor class zero. They don't move much, but doesn't matter to these guys. Ten to 12 hit dice. Yeah. <laughs> they get one attack, but it's five to 20 points of damage. And... They get six poisonous strands that come out for da- uh, special attacks. And, well, magic resistance, 80%. So, Ooh. yeah, good luck, folks. Yeah. Um, and the, the the Ropers, they kind of look like uh, they inhabit subterranean caverns, but their favorite food are human beings. Mmm. Mm. Tastes like chicken. Um, How would you know? Anyway, moving along, uh, <laughs> they can um, squash themselves down, make themselves almost flat, and they or you know make them almost look like a stalactite. Uh, usually, their gizzards hold uh, several platinum pieces or several types of gems. Now, where this creature is nasty is when it has these sticky rope-like strands that shoot out of its body. And it says two to five inches, and that's supposed to translate actually to 20 to 50 feet. Okay? And there, the hit causes weakness. And it's you get half of your strength sucked away for about one to three melee rounds. And then the prey is drawn into their mouth, and they're quickly devoured. And uh, also... Go on. The, yeah. the chance of breaking the strand is the same as uh, your open doors. Um, 
and if you're getting dragged towards it, it's like every 10 feet you get dragged towards the thing. Uh, they're unaffected by lightning, take half damage from most uh, uh, from cold, but they are very susceptible to fire. Fire! So, fire! <laughs> so, like, yeah, get out your uh, uh, flasks of oil, um, fireballs, but you got that 80% magic resistance, so... You, wait, you're saying it's, it's uh, susceptible to fire, right? Yes, it has a minus four on its saving throws to fire. That's weird because in the, what is it, OP1 Tales of the Outer Plane, they have a flame roper in there. Weird. <laughs> I'm looking at it right here. They're able to shoot uh, flares in a range of 20 feet. It's on page 32 of the module. Wow. Wow. Well, now the roper also has a uh, a sub relative of it, the stow, the stow roper, I guess it'd be pronounced. And that's in the monster manual, too. Looks very similar, smaller, not as powerful, but it has a really cool defense that if you get hit by its strands and it's it's got a more of a stony exterior to itself, basically this it immobilizes you. And then once you recover, you actually fight for the store roper to the best of your ability and try to defend it. <laughs> so... That's it's like that's the stow roper and the roper. Uh, I think they're I I like the roper. It's a very nasty creature. Oh, this uh, fire one's pretty nasty too. I'm looking at here. Yeah, and I think it was uh, Matt or Will was able to find it was the module area of the slave lords. There is a roper encounter, and in, in that in that one particular yeah. module, an area of the slave lords. That's the last one in the series. In a four. Yes. Yeah, I which is pretty nasty because you if, if <laughs> that's the one where like you're pretty much like naked, yeah. <laughs> you're captured yep. by the slave lords, and you're making yourself through the the dungeons there, uh, the caverns and everything. That's right. And if you run up against one of these and you got nothing to fight with it, you're doomed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're gonna have some problems. Yeah, uh, you're. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, you're Roper bait. Yeah, so, you are. Well, I can tell you what I do know about ropers. As a matter of fact, uh, there is an ecology on the roper. And, and ropers are, are, are an extremely interesting creature because of how they they like to eat humans or whatever mm-hmm. prey they catch. They revel in the fact that when they capture a creature, paralyze it, even with the weakness, we know what it means. Mm-hmm. Uh, they like to chew on it from the legs first. Oh, they try no. to keep the creature alive as long as possible because they uh and, and it doesn't explain so much in the monster manual just understand that as 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 the game has evolved into other editions they gave the creature more of an intelligence and it feeds off the the energy of a creature that is suffering while it's chewing on it it's it's actually pretty yeah. interesting. Mm. Oh yes, they 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 don't eat creatures very quickly. It's a very slow process. They like to the mash. You know what it is? They feed off the the marrow inside the bones, and they like mashing it. Ah. And they and they just love the fact that the creature's paralyzed. They know it's paralyzed, and they know it's in pain while it's eating it. So, and they have a phenomenal community how they work together and so on. So, uh, this, this was an ecology article in Dragon. Yeah. Uh, there's an interesting ecology. As a matter of fact, I'm just telling you from the, the what, what Pathfinder did was it's a thing called Monsters Revisited, and they take all the old school monsters and, and do a big ecology on it. It's very interesting. Oh, okay. Well, they they take the old ecology and redo the ecology. So exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It was a Dragon Two Thirty Two is oh, the ecology okay. of the Roper. It's a second edition. Okay. And I do have to say, as much as Pathfinder is not first edition, they do a great job on that revisited article. They oh, yeah, want- all of them. On all the monsters revisited, mm. they do a great job because they put so much flesh or oh. whatever into these monsters. It's great. Uh, and Ropers apparently like flesh, especially yeah. when it's kicking and screaming yeah. and it goes into their mouths. But <laughs> that actually does present the opportunity as it's slowly chewing its food. Any of your other companions that happen to be captured by it, you have time to free. There you go. Exactly. That's right. Yep. You're only as slow as the whole, slowest person running in the party. Right. <laughs> right. So that, I know Will 
It's like, yeah, when you in combat, um, I don't have to run fast, just faster than you. Right. <laughs> I trip. I trip my fellow companion. <laughs> that is too funny. That would be something a gnome would do. Yes. <laughs> but that's a horrible monster. I, I just the, the the way it does yeah. that. It, it even worse and you know if someone survives an attack and said you knew this monster was chomping on you for at least 20 30 minutes it just just that that just alone should just make someone scared of dealing with a creature like this yeah yeah i eat it for breakfast yes Mm. (laughs) yeah that could even be a nice little they're going through some underground cavern or whatever and they just hear some screams and as they get closer and closer, they see like a half devoured person sticking out of a rope or screaming for help. Wow. Oh, oh yeah, it's just gross. That reminds me of that movie. I don't know if you ever saw uh, uh, Deep Blue with yes. an underwater monster. Oh. Would, you know, suck the juices out of him. That's just a horrible monster. Yeah. Oh, God, I, thought, and, I thought you were going to say human centipede for a minute. Oh, oh. no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought it was called Deep Blue or something like that. That because uh, those were that like it was something like a sh- that was like a shark though. I thought no, that was Deep Blue Sea. Oh, Deep Blue Sea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this one was Deep Blue. The creature from Deep Blue was real similar to this. What it do is it will it will grab you and like kind of swallow you. But while it's doing it, use its teeth to puncture holes in you, and it sucks the juice out of your body as you're slowly going through its body. It's really nasty. Mm. It, you're slowly digesting while you're still alive. Sounds like a trip. Oh, no, I don't think so. I think it's just, it's just <laughs> horrible just the thought of something like this chewing on you, and you know it. Well, yeah. all right. Let's see what people have to say about the creature themselves. Write it in and tell us how you'd use this creature. And let's head into Dragon Sword. As the secret portal yields to your efforts, you stand amazed at a vision from the most fevered dreams of avarice. Before you lies the dragon's horn. Dragon's horn, roar! Anyway, <laughs> Let's give it a roar. 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 And we got the Efreeti bottle this week. I've always called it Efreeti. Is it pronounced a different way to you guys? I've always said Efreet. So. Efreet? I've said Efreeti. That's how I've always pronounced it. How you pronounce Efreeti. it how you want. Yeah, whatever. Tomato, tomato. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what this is, is basically your typical, well, not typical, this is your genie in a bottle, but except the normal genie is an air genie or a dingy, as they would call it. This is a, the fire version of it. Mm-hmm. Now, normally what this would do is you'd find this, you uncork it, and this fire, if Freddy would come out, and there is a 10% chance that he would come out and attack you and become insane. Or... There is an, if you flip to the monster manual, uh, I'll just pop open my book here, on page 37, he will do the following. He will either grant you three wishes or haunt you until you grant him the, to, the three wishes. He can become invisible, assume gaseous form, detect magic, and large polymorph self. He can do pretty much anything. Now, I think what DM Kojo was asking for this whole thing was not necessarily the monster itself. But does he think this would break the game if we use this magic item? I think this would totally break a game. Yeah, that's the potential of breaking a, a campaign because, what, 10% chance the thing is insane in there and it will come out and like yeah. kill you? Mm-hmm. But that's only 10% chance. Right. The other 90% chance it says, you know, it's going to do the, you know, ha ha, I am Kazam. Yeah. Oh. Oh, look, because I got you three wishes. Get them over with. Right. It's like, oh, great. Now I got Shaquille O'Neal who's going to give me three wishes. Fantastic. But at which point, (laughs) depending on how you are as a DM and how your players word those wishes, they might have rather it came out insane. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) One thing about these guys is they're they're the ones that DM Joe would love and how I would love, too. They hold each letter and word to the T. Yep. Oh, yeah. So you forget that A, the, E, we, the, they go, <laughs> at the dot, your eye. <laughs> These are the rules lawyers. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, if the guy, if you if you tell the free day, hey, make me a stick, well, that bad boy is just going to laugh his butt off and turn you into a little stick. Yep. You know, I mean, 
<laughs> but you know, the Afrid, what's real funny about this is because if, I don't know if you all ever played the Pharaoh series, the, the series of, of those three modules in the, the second part of that series is the whole problem with the, with the second and third one, because they let loose an Afrid and he's the bad guy for those next two modules. Oh, wow. oh, that's right. Oh, my God, you're right. I forgot that's about that. That's right. So that's when, I, you know, for some reason, I have no clue as, as what the dealer, I, I can't remember right now off, uh, off my mind right now, but I don't know if they find a bottle, but somehow the characters find a bottle or something. They, they let this guy go. He's free, and he's the, the pain in the butt for two modules until, right. you know, the party dispatches him in, 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 the, in the next module or now, in the third am, one. Am I thinking correctly? I thought... If an Afridi bottle is empty, you can use it to capture one? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that right? I played okay. that before, yeah. Yeah, I could have sworn that, you know, if you find, if it becomes empty or if you find one that's empty, you that's... can capture an Afridi with it somehow. Same thing with the Dingy, as far as I was concerned. I've done the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Hmm. I, I could have sworn there was something like that. It all depends on the DM. Yeah. Well, I tell you, that's not a very good act if you imprison a creature within a bottle to, to make it. But you know, the, fourth of Serbia. That's how you get your three wishes, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember from the from the movie Aladdin, the, was it incredible cosmic powers? Itty bitty tiny living space. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Sorry, I brought in a Disney reference. Oh, back to the whole point. We'll just unbalance the campaign. I'm gonna have to say a big yes, unless you plan this to give this to one of those players in the group you feel that is a fair player. That yeah. will balance everything out in the game for you. You know when you run a game who is going to be that person in your group. You just don't give this to the min max or rule lawyer. I'm going to get the ultimate power, you know, player in your group. Mm-hmm. What about you, Nick? What would you do? Well, you know, if this magic item popped up, I would say I've always considered this item like the this is the uh, the death blossom. Yeah if you will, borrowing from the last starfighter. This is the last resort thing. You know, 10% chance I open this, it's going to kill everybody, including me. Or other 90% chance I'm going to get, it's going to give me three wishes and maybe work with me here. So this would be like the last resort magic item. Like if you're going against, you know, a real nasty creature, say you're going against that that, that dragon or players won't know that. But I mean, if they acquired a free bottle, they identified it, and it's still within their possession. I'm just saying. How would they know that, about the ten percent chance? Well, they they wouldn't. Oh, okay. They You're wouldn't. They would know. They they know there might be a chance it might be insane, but they don't know if it will be until they open it. That's what I'm saying. Well, how do they know it's insane? How do they know there's a percent chance it's insane? Well, they wouldn't. That's what I'm trying to get. They, how, uh, you know, that's what I mean. What they identify, they can identify what the thing is, and they know through, like, legend maybe through lore? legend lore or something like that. If they research it, they know they'll find out that these are Freedy bottles. Sometimes that these Freedy bottles have an Freedy that might be insane inside. Okay, okay. I was just trying to clarify between that. Oh yeah, yeah. That's how I. That's how I kind of play it, and that hence why I was saying yeah. This if the players had this item, I. If we had it, if I was a player in our party and we knew what through time and everything what this thing was, yeah, we would keep it as like the last resort magic item to use. <laughs> okay. It's like, you know, this is like, you know, hands down, okay, you know, the, we're at our last few hit points here. This is what we do. <laughs> we let the Afreed out. <laughs> All right. uh, Will, what about you? Oh, I mean, this item is extremely powerful. Uh, I mean, absolutely powerful. And I have to take into effect what are the alignments of the characters in the group. So now, if, if they eventually learn that it is in a bottle that, that is has a, a lawful evil or an evil creature imprisoned, I mean, there's two ways they can handle it. One, it's a prison for a reason. Take the bottle, bury it. The second one is, is use the bottle, free the creature, and let it return back to from whence it came, so it doesn't create, you know, cause any more evil problems on on the current plane. So no, no, this is definitely uh, something that would have to be uh, well uh, versed in. The DM has to know what they're dealing with. I would make sure that the DM knows that wishes limit those wishes. I mean, even though they grant wishes, doesn't mean it can't grant just limited wishes. Yeah. Right. Well, what about you, Matt? For me. This is more of a quest item. They'll have a specific reason to acquire it and a specific use for the wishes contained inside. 
So it's not just going to randomly pop up for them to do whatever they want with willy nilly. It's going to actually appear for a a purpose. A purpose. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the, I, it's not. Oh going yeah, to... I would plan it that way too. Right. Yeah. If it's... I was on the DM side, yeah, it's not just going to be there on a random roll. When R- we exactly. Made up exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, this. It might lead us other stuff. Right. It, it'll have. To, it'll have a purpose for it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Don't you think it's a little railroadish doing it that way. Uh, is it any railroad? Is railroady is any like plot item you put in the game? Yeah, I guess true, but yeah. If you, I'm thinking, I think of it more as a plot item than just like a random magic item. Right. Okay. So, and I like the idea that you know, that Will is saying, like in the the uh, the uh, uh, Desert of Desolation series of modules, mm-hmm. you have the potential of a of another adversary here, another nemesis for your player characters. Nemesis. Nemesis. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So that's what we think about it. So there. Stick that in your crow. I'm kidding. <laughs> Stick that in your fifth edition rules and see how you feel about it. Bye. Yeah, Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need one of these to, so we could wish fifth edition was first edition. Yeah. Yeah. How about we just wish Wizards of the Coast away? <laughs> That would solve all the problems. Anyway, let's <laughs> add the Dragon Sword segment on, segment on that statement and head into our outro. Time is short now. They are coming swiftly, and we have but a moment. You must make your voice heard now. Cast your ballot against the ten-foot pole. All right, folks, I guess we're in our end segment here, the outro than the 10 foot pole so we have a new 10 foot pole that will be out here very soon and for everybody listening this is what it is you've just run into the big bad evil guy at the climax of your adventure and the fighters are charging into battle what third level spell will the magic user cast first okay a fireball who cares if the warriors get a little singed yes B, protection from evil, 10-foot radius. Those guys are going to need a little help in the melee. No. C, monster summoning one. Let's get some expendable pawns into the game. (laughs) D, haste. Let's get this over with more quickly. So, fireball, protection from evil, 10-foot radius, monster summoning one, haste. Vince, what's your choice? I'm going with the fireball. Screw those fighters. I'm protecting myself. (laughs) Fireball. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going for protection from evil because I think they'll make a better meat shield to protect me if, if they stay alive a little longer. Gives me a better chance to run. Okay. And I also didn't know what level of magic user we are. Right. So. Well, I assume since we're casting a uh, third level spell, we're high enough level. Okay. Well, I know, but I'm just saying. Could are we a tenth level magic user? Or are we fifth. seventh? I believe fifth. or fifth? Seventh? Fifth. fifth. Yeah. To seventh. Okay. okay. All right. What about you? Uh, over yeah. the, oh, you, Matt, you already did. I'm sorry, Will. Oh, I I, I chose haste. Haste. Because I, really? Yeah, I took haste because if not a two attacks around, it's not bad. So if you figure if they were seventh level, oh now nah, we got some damage pumping out. They should be dead in two rounds. I for me, I would choose monster summoning one. Meat shields, <laughs> perfect meat shields right there. Going to divide up all the attacks from the big bad evil guy. He's going to have to get through, you know, whatever I throw him and monster summoning one. So, yeah, I'm gonna. I, that's what I would go with. So, we shall uh, hear from our. Uh, listeners out there, what they if they go on to the RFI podcast website, we'll have it up there very yeah. soon. Our poll is it already up there? Yeah, it's already up there. Oh, well, well. they're not going to answer to it because Vince killed him with the fireball spell. <laughs> well, there you go. Well. <laughs> That's rfipodcast.com, right in the middle of the page. The 10 foot poll vote, vote often, vote twice, like Jason used to do. <laughs> <laughs> And that's going to put a wrap on the show. And welcome to 2012 of the Row for an Inch of Podcast. Trick or Gems! Anyway. 
all yep. the way from Texas did that one come from? There's something in that drinking water down there, Vince. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, support our show. Definitely try to get the app and download that, and also um, buy a shirt. Nick needs you know Nick needs, Nick needs food on his table. Hmm? That's right. I got two young mouths to feed. That's right. It's a cool <laughs> shirt. I mean, it's a dragon and a fighter, and it says the Roll for Initial Podcast. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Happy New Year, everyone. See you all later. Roll for initiative.